All right. Well, why don't we get started? Um, my name is Ruth Nicholson. I'm one of the customer success um, folks at Team Genius. Um, and with me is Gabe Skelly, who's our customer success manager. And we are glad that you are here. <clears throat> We've been trying to do this every week to offer a place for people to ask questions, share ideas um, across sports, across geographies, um, as we all try to figure out how we're going to return to play um, and, and make that successful. <clears throat> what we do every week is um, gather up questions and ideas and topics during the week as people um, uh, register for the meeting. Um, and then sometimes we have uh, folks that we can tap, that we can invite to help us, that have some special expertise in some of the topics that are coming up. And so, um, Gabe, would you like to introduce Jason? Yeah, we got uh, Jason Jacobs here, who's got, uh, I'll let him uh, talk about more of what he does, but I know I've, I've uh, had some interworkings with him with some of the, the club stuff in uh, Minnesota, and he's the head of uh, Adrenaline Sports Club, and uh, actually used Team Genius for a long time, one of the first, uh, one of our first early users to start using uh, technology to do, you know, stuff with sporting clubs, so. Right. Um, so a lot of the questions that came in this week from soccer, from rowing, um, from lacrosse, all had to do with fields and facilities. So that's, uh, we're really glad that uh, Jason is here. Minnesota has been opening up a little ahead of some of the rest of us. We're still largely shut down where I live. Um, and he's been learning some things about what they plan to do and what's actually happening in his facility. So um, Jason, so as you've been opening up in Minnesota, you said you opened up June 1st. What are some of the key things that you're discovering you have to consider as you're opening up your fields and facilities right now? Um, well, we're an indoor facility, so obviously our dynamic's a little bit different. Um, but we are a very large indoor facility. We're a 56,000 square foot building. We have three uh, fields that are essentially the size of a um, a hockey a hockey rink and then we have three basketball courts so we've kind of gone along the route now that when we're talking about our facility and what we're doing we're operating more like we're an outdoor facility than actually an indoor facility just because of the size of our space um, so we're following a lot of the guidelines that youth groups uh, in Minnesota are following as far as what they're doing outdoors um, maximum groups of 10 uh, social distancing contactless training and things like that um, so again even though we're an indoor facility we're kind of functioning as an outdoor facility at this point. And really our focus is on our traffic flow, um, how we're getting people in and out of our building, um, how our capacity is as far as who can be in which areas, when and how many people, uh, and then our sanitation and, and things like that that everybody's kind of focused in on. Um, so for the most part, it's been pretty smooth. Uh, we're kind of gradually open up. We did go from closed to wide open, uh, but we have groups in pretty much every day, anywhere from seven in the morning till 10 at night. Uh, sometimes we have multiple groups in, sometimes it's just one or two here or there. Um, but it's uh, we're just kind of slowly trying to ramp things up as we get the opportunity to, to do so. Um, probably our biggest challenge at this point is just keeping up with how things are changing for activities in in general. So for those of you from Minnesota, uh, you're probably all aware that they have this low level risk, medium level risk, and high level risk uh, as far as how their categories in sport. So uh, our biggest challenge right now is since we have some of each of those groups within our building, just how we continue to navigate what they're going to be able to do and what they're not able to do. So are the, the requirements that you're facing coming from your local government, your county government, your state government? I mean, how are you getting the, the, rule, the rules of play right now? So we're, we're focusing just on using the Minnesota Department of Health state guidelines for youth sports. Uh, so even though we are an indoor facility, uh, when we look at our capacity, how many kids and what they're supposed to be doing and things like that, we're following the state guidelines. Um, the challenging part about that, I think for anybody and everybody, is they're somewhat detailed, but they're also, you know, 
it, it's hard to read through all the pieces of information that are out there and know exactly what you know kids should and should not be doing when they're out on the field participating. Um, knowing that you're trying to create a safe environment as much as you can, um, but also knowing that by nature of activity, uh, for kids to be in boxes standing 10 feet apart or whatever it is from each other for the entire time that they're within a session uh, just presents as challenges when you're just trying to get the kids, uh, trying to keep the kids active. Right, so you're a multi-sport facility. You've got soccer and volleyball. What are your sports? So right now we have uh, some soccer training going on. Uh, we have quite a bit of basketball and volleyball. We, that, that part of our business is actually picked up because so many schools that a lot of organizations use in the summer are not allowing them in right now. So a lot of our basketball and volleyball users typically have gone to schools in the summer and not been allowed to right now. Uh, so they're coming to us uh, to fill that need. And then the other thing that we have that's a little bit unique, we, we actually have an essential business at our location called uh, AK a sport that is a weekly sport camp that is classified as an essential business because a lot of their participants actually come from 7 a.m. 7 8 a.m. all the way to 4 5 p.m. and their parents use it as as daycare so it's a sports camp but it qualifies as daycare because that's what people there's people that literally send their kids to this camp all 13 weeks all summer long and use it as their daycare so we have, I think, 24 kids in this week as part of that program as well. So um, that group is here the entire day. And then we have basketball, uh, volleyball, soccer. Uh, we had a baseball group in earlier this week when it rained outside. Um, so then all those other groups are coming in as kind of individual groups throughout the week. So if you've got high, medium, and low risk sports, and you've got state health rules about what the, the rules of play are for each of those. Um, I'm imagining that the groups that come in to use it are, I mean, you've got to communicate with all of them about what's required. How are you helping the clubs and the teams that come in communicate with their, their folks, their coaches and parents about what's expected? Um, so we, we just have a, uh, that's about a page and a half document that are our guidelines and that really focuses around our cleanliness, our traffic flow, our scheduling and things like that. Uh, we have a waiver uh, that we're very diligent about making sure every kid that's coming through our facility has their waiver turned in and their parents are aware, aware of how we're operating uh, along those lines um, and just a lot of follow up and communication, just trying to get everybody on the same page so they know what things are supposed to look like as they as they come into the facility. Um, and then ultimately just monitoring as, as best you can. Um, as a business, we found that you do have to put some onus on those users. You can't, you know, you can't monitor every second of every group that they're in the facility uh, and, and what they're, they're doing. So you kind of set the expectation that these are the guidelines that they're supposed to be following, not only for us as a facility, but that the state has put in place and they put some onus on the trainers and the adults and the coaches working with those groups saying, uh, just like if they were outside, here's how you're supposed to be handling things. Here's what your kids are supposed to be doing. And, and then kind of let them monitor it from, from there. So um, we're just constantly checking in. And, and, and I think in the simplest terms, trying to make sure things look like what they're supposed to look like when, uh, when, when groups are out there. Has there been anything that has surprised you as you're opening up things that you expected to, to go one way and they went a different way? Oh, yeah, like I said, we're kind of gradually moving into things. So as we continue to add things and, uh, and, and bring things back in, um, I'm sure there'll be some things that come up. But, uh, you know, we're being very strict on the pods of 10 uh, and, and grouping and things like that. So there's groups saying, well, can we bring in 12? My answer is just no. It's, right now it's 10. We hope to get to 12 or 14 or 16 as we, because we do have some larger spaces that we can get to that type of capacity, but we're really focusing in on the groups of 10 right now uh, just to make things manageable. And a lot of our groups that come in, they're a trainer with three to four kids. So it's fairly easy to, to manage. Um, so that's probably the big thing. I think the, the, the challenging things for all of us, for, so just for an example, so like when a, a basketball trainer comes in to work with a group of three or four kids, you know, we have things marked out and it's skilled training and they're also, you know, they're each using their own ball 
and they're doing skill training and trying to maintain their social distancing. But anytime you put three or four kids on a court to shoot, you know, the ball comes off the rim, off the boards. So the balls are bouncing around and you, know, yep. you get to that point, it's not possible for them to be completely separated to each other for an entire hour training session where somebody else's ball is not going to come to them or they go to get their ball and they, you know, they shrink their distance between for that short interval of time. So I think that's the thing that most of us are really just trying to work through at this point is with the nature just activities going on, um, you know, how you maintain your social distancing and your protocols as best as possible, knowing that you can't control every ball for every minute of every time that they're in there. Jason, are you seeing like, do you have pe pe demand where people want to have facility open 24 hours a day to get enough you know, time in where they can do stuff indoors or what's the demand looking like? Um, demand is pretty good, especially on the, like I said, on the court side, uh, our court usage is definitely up over last summer, just because again, there are so many groups that can't get into schools and other facilities that they've used in the past. So that part has increased, um, as a business owner, I've told people that, you know, after being shut down for 11 weeks from a financial standpoint, if you want to come in at 3 a.m., I'll come open up for you at 3 a.m. We need every, we need every dollar we can get at this point from a revenue, uh, spot. So we have 24 hour access to our building. So, um, we're a little heavier during the day, you know, probably 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, we're a little bit heavier, and then we tend to pick up kind of another round of activity between 5 and 8 p.m. But uh, tonight, my first group came in at 7.30 this morning, and my last group will come in from 9 to 10 tonight. Oh, wow. What questions do some of the rest of you have for Jason? Anybody feel free to turn on your mic and video and ask question or type out and chat up to you guys, but uh, open for questions with Jason. Hi, Jason. So, um, can you tell me what, um, what level of uh, disinfecting uh, you need to do for uh, the equipment, like between, like you have, a, say, one group handling balls, or, and then you need to switch to another group. And, like, what, what level of uh, disinfecting is necessary? So uh, the protocols that we have in place is, is a as a facility we're not providing any equipment so groups have to bring in their own equipment uh, and that's again just to keep things uh, a little bit more controlled on our end we you know when we're running our full normal activity we have volleyballs and soccer balls and uh, basketballs and stuff that kids can use when they come into play so we've done away with that so groups that come in have to be scheduled for their time bring in their own equipment and then the way we have it is we essentially have it that they're there's again a volleyball group or basketball while coming in they do have to disinfect their the balls that they'll be using the carts that they're using or whatever uh, prior to the start of the session and then again at the end of the, the session trying to keep the touching limited to one kid as possible as much as possible but again if a ball comes off one kid and goes to another kid they're grabbing it and throwing back to the other one and then we have a minimum of a 15 minute uh scheduling gap in between groups so even if a trainer's coming to work to into work with three groups for an hour each session they're scheduled for an hour they have to have at least a 15 minute break before that next group comes in so that allows us to do two things as a facility allows us to get one group out before that next group comes in and it allows that trainer to then disinfect their equipment over that 15 minutes so at least it's clean before that next group comes in so part of what we've been hearing a lot of is you know as you're I guess tracking and tracing people that are coming in, you wanna make sure that if you have four or five individuals in at the same time, you know exactly who is in and that the group using that set of equipment were the only ones using that set of equipment that may have been touching them during that time that when that next group comes in, that equipment has been clean. So that next group is again, same situation where you know who was in and who possibly could have been touching that equipment over that hour. Um, as a facility, uh, we just kind of hit hot spots as far as our cleaning. Obviously, it's impossible to completely clean uh, a court uh, or a field in between each group, but we do a quick, just a bleach mopping of any kind of hot spots where they had a higher level of activity. The nice thing for us from a turf standpoint is our three turf fields are pretty much like grass. You know, if there's any sweating or things like that going on, it's settling into our, our turf just like wood for grass. Uh, so there's not really any reason to clean the turf in between usage. Uh, we just kind of get hit any hot spots where kids may have been touching uh, goal poles or things like that as we rotate between groups. And uh, what type of products 
do you use? For um, so for us as a facility, we're, we're heavy on the bleach part of things. So when we clean our bathrooms and we clean our contact areas, uh, it's bleach wipes, bleach spray, uh, water with bleach for our, our mopping. Uh, all of our surfaces work well with that. And then the groups that are coming in are using a wide variety of things. Uh, some are using bleach wipes and stuff like that, just to wipe down the balls in between. Uh, some have sanitation spray that they're using that they're wiping down with. Uh, our protocol basically says it has to kind of hit that same as hand sanitizer, that 80% alcohol or 99% disinfectant, whatever it is, is as far as the cleaning goes. So, um, yeah, there's there's a variety. Some, you know, and it kind of depends on the person too. Some people are using more of those natural products that are classified that way. Some are just using the, you know, the Clorox bleach type sprays. Um, but everybody's making sure that they're giving stuff a good cleaning in between uh, in between their groups. Thank you. The, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency actually has a list on its website of approved cleaners for different types of um, sanitizing and viruses and, and bacteria and stuff. So if you're, if you're trying to figure out if what you have is on the list, there actually is a list. Um, Colin, you had a couple of questions. One, um, Jason, are you providing sanitizer and are you doing temperature checks as people come to the facility? Uh, as far as the sanitizer, again, as a facility, we're monitoring our own sanitizing in that standpoint. So we do require uh, the initial sanitizer, sanitizing when players come in. So the other thing we've done to control traffic flow is, you know, we have a couple different entrances to start building, but that's been limited now to one. So everybody that comes in has to come in through the same entrance. They literally have to walk by our concession and office area and walk by me because I'm the one that's pretty much doing all the work right now. Uh, as far as here, so I can monitor things. Uh, so they have to walk by, they have to check in, they have to sanitize their hands as they come in. Uh, so that's kind of our protocol for getting them as they come in. When they, they stop for their check-in, uh, we make sure that the waiver is in, we make sure they sanitize their hand, and then we direct them to whatever part of our facility that they are going to. So we provide that piece. Uh, the cleaning and sanitizing that the groups are doing, they're providing their, their own. So what they're cleaning their equipment with, each group is providing their own sanitation for that. Uh, even for the AK sport group in here with their, their group, they have some protocols in for their daycare type setting. Uh, and they monitor their own kids as far as their hand sanitation and, and things like that. And then we just kind of maintain the facilities. Um, the temperature checks, we are not doing that as far as entry. Um, I do it for myself. So I am the only technical employee right now that's, that's working. Um, so I'm the one that's in here checking people and things like that. So I do record my temperature every morning just from a, a staffing uh, point just to make sure that I'm not showing any symptoms. Um, but again, then for us as a business, we've kind of put that onus back on um, our users that they are supposed to clearly communicate to members that if they are showing any COVID type symptoms or have a temperature of any sort, uh, that they should not be allowed to participate. Um, I think that's another area that, you know, the guidance is kind of there, but how you monitor that is is hard as I think it's similar to restaurants. You don't want people coming in when they're, they're sick or showing symptoms, but uh, you can't necessarily monitor everybody uh, every minute of, of every portion. So um, but we do also have the requirement like all other businesses I have at the point that if somebody has been in and has shown symptoms that that needs to be communicated to us so we can do the proper follow-up from, uh, from there. So um, another question, a um, little different angle um, about, you said that all your folks have to sign a waiver. Um, I know that Cal South Soccer came out with some really extensive waivers um, in here in the last week that I keep seeing being copied around state to state. But who drafted your waiver and approved it to make sure it, it fit your facility? So we essentially took our standard waiver that we've used for multiple years that was put together both by our, our attorney um, and our insurance agent. Um, both did a quick review of it before we opened back up. We did put um, some COVID specific uh, information on our, our waiver. It's actually posted on our website. I believe you can go in there and, and look at it if you'd like. Um, but our, wa our waiver was just kind of a blurb on there. And, and in general, um, the information that we got both from an insurance and a legal standpoint 
was as a facility, um, it really comes down to neglect more than anything else. Um, you, you have to be following the guidelines. You have to be doing your protocols and following your protocols that you put uh, in place as far as the facility. But at the end of the day, you know, a waiver is not going to necessarily protect you from everything. The waiver really kind of is generated around the idea that people are going to accept some risk coming into this environment. They're aware of the potential for COVID-19 to be there uh, and that by participating in the activity that they're participating in, um, that it is a potential that you could contract it while while here, knowing that we are doing everything possible as a facility, just like restaurants and everybody else, to minimize that risk, but we cannot guarantee 100% uh, you know, risk-free environment as anybody can't. So, so we, didn't, we didn't make a lot of changes to our waiver. We just yeah. kind of added that piece in, knowing at the end of the day, I don't think anybody knows if um, if something was brought to a court as far as a legal action, what that would ultimately look out. Um, and at the end of the day, how somebody would prove at the end of the day that they specifically caught COVID from the interaction that they had at your facility, at the activity they were, you know, they were participating in when they could have contracted it uh, you know, anywhere. Yeah. Hey, Jim, what's on your mind? Uh, with you, I know you can't have athletes wearing masks all the time, although attempting to participate, it's a little too restrictive, but, um, the workers at your facility, as they move around, are they required to have masks on? Yeah. So our, our language kind of revolves around masking is encouraged, especially for the trainers. I know our trainers will typically have one when they come in, uh, and begin with and kind of when they're having their, you know, just getting their group settled in. Uh, but in general, I think most of our trainers are removing their mask when they get into their training session, just from the standpoint of kids being able to hear. I know we've had a couple of coaches that have tried, you know, wearing the mask while they're coaching and instructing. It just allows, you know, leads to a lot of frustration for them and their athletes because they just can't, can't hear them. So I think in general, the trainers and the coaches that are out there are just making sure that they're very conscious as far as keeping their distance from players as they're speaking to them. Um, I know watching a couple of them work, a lot of times they'll kind of give their information. And if they want to move a little bit closer to give a, a little bit of a feel for what they're talking about demonstration wise, they're really making sure that they're just keeping that distance um, while trying to communicate that, that information out. So, uh, so yeah, I, th I think coming into the building, leaving the building, and those little interactions that people have prior to actually being engaged in their activity, the, the masking is pretty prevalent with the adults. Uh, but as they're actually involved in the activity and the training and the games, um, wearing a mask by anybody is pretty limited at this point. Yeah. So you run leagues out of your facility under normal circumstances? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that'll be very similar to, uh, again, the outdoor piece is – the two things that we know will probably be the last things to come back to us for our facility will be uh, league play. And then we used to have uh, open gym where we'd have periods of the day where people could come in, pay a $5 fee and come in during that open gym and just find an open spot and play. Uh, and that dynamic, I don't see that dynamic coming back likely until there's probably a vaccine with that, just because as of right now, we need to make sure we're very diligent about controlling who's in the building, when, how many people um, are tracking and all those other pieces. So we know, who, again, who's in, what they're doing, what they're involved in, and we're able to track that very, very well. So um, I'm hoping, I think like anybody else, that games and league play will start to come back in the fall. Uh, our, our next real leagues wouldn't start up till November anyway. So uh, that would be our, our goal is to be able to resume those just like they are outside by the time we hit November. But I think games and league play are going to be one of those last things that come back in. Right. So have you developed uh, plans about disinfecting balls and equipment and stuff for league play, or is that something you're still working on? Yeah. So that would be, it, once we got to league play, there'd be a couple of things, again, depending on where guidelines are at that point that we know we'd have to be uh, aware of just knowing the typical league environment. Um, a would be the equipment. Cause at that point, when you're operating the league as a facility, I think you have to be pretty diligent about uh, the equipment being used 
Um, so rather than again, having kids come in and warm up with all their own soccer balls and things like that. And then you pick one out of the heap and you use that for the game. We would probably control not only the balls being used for warm up, but the balls being used for league play, just so we can control that equipment piece, uh, for that type of environment. And then the other one, especially with being an indoor facility is how we would control our spectator piece. Um, maybe that's loosened up by the time we hit November, but you know, for us, if we have uh, our two fields that are side by side in use, you know, you have lines of parents along the walls and along in between the fields, you know, shoulder to shoulder watching those games. So we may have to stagger uh, how we schedule our uh, our leagues or limit the number of you know one parent per kid type of a thing so we can space people out or so they're watching games. A lot of that will depend on what the uh, the health department releases release by the time we get to that uh, that point. So. Um, to me, a lot of it is controlling your environment. I think that's the thing that I've been preaching and that we've been talking about more than anything is uh, your ability as a facility to control how people are getting in and out, how people are sanitizing as they come in and out, what equipment is being used and how that's being sanitized, um, and just trying to control that use rather than saying our doors are open, this group is going here, and, uh, and off you go like we've been able to do in the past. <laughs> So you mentioned you you basically were shut down for about 11 weeks, um, which probably doesn't do much for cash flowing. Um, Brian's asking, have you adjusted your facility fees um, to either recoup some of your loss, losses um, or lowered your fees to encourage more rentals? I mean, how is that working from a business standpoint? Uh, well, there's two different pieces. So our, you know, our losses over 11 weeks are, are substantial and we've, um, as a facility, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with these, these terms. So PPP really didn't help us out much. We did just qualify for a PPP, uh, loan. Um, but for us, it's minimal because we, you know, we, we sell space. So our, you know, our, payroll is maybe 6% of our total yearly expenses because it's primarily me. And then I have some other people that work in our, the heart of our season. Uh, so our payroll just isn't a big chunk of what our, our costs are, our costs are our rent, our um, insurance, our taxes and, uh, um, and things like that are our fixed costs. Um, so our, our our, our lending piece that we're really trying to work with is we're still trying to qualify for uh, the economic injury loan through the SBA uh, because that can be used a little bit more specifically for those purposes. So um, the financial part, the, the, the big losses over that 11 weeks, we are still tackling. And realistically, that's gonna be probably a, a several year process to recoup and figure out how we regain that, especially since it's lost time that we're not able to get back. Um, but we are actually right now we're just we're using our current summer rates. So our our summer rental rates are typically half price of our normal rates. Uh, so we charge twenty five dollars per court, eighty dollars per field, and we're just sticking with those. Um, we are actually providing some discounts to people that are built booking multiple hours and multiple times and things like that. Uh, especially on the courts where some groups are getting $20 an hour per court because they're booking, you know, 20 hours over the next four or five weeks. And we're trying to encourage them to do that longer term uh, commitment. Um, looking ahead, uh, as far as what we'll do with fees when you get into the heart of our season from November to April, um, we haven't tackled that issue yet because part of that depends a little bit on what kind of financial help we're actually able to secure over the next couple of months. Uh, to recoup things. Um, and it's also trying to, to maintain things, knowing that as a facility, when you're passing along costs, even if you're passing them on to associations and other users like that, they're also passing them along to, uh, to families. So we're trying to be pretty mindful of where our financial needs are as a business, but also understanding that those financial impacts uh, you know, affect families as well. So it's going to be a fine line as far as what you can possibly increase to try to recoup some revenues without outpricing the ability for people to continue using your facility like, uh, like you need them to. So. 
Yeah, we've talked um, in, in past weeks, um, we've got, you know, sports who are largely outdoor sports, sports that are indoor sports, um, and, and some of the challenges there. Kenneth is asking about, are you changing anything with your ventilation system? Because that's one of those big differences between the indoor and outdoor. Yeah, we're, we're incredibly fortunate as far as a facility goes. So we're actually in a warehouse type building, uh, but we're brand new. It just opened in February 2018. It's a brand new building. Uh, so all of our air conditioning, heating systems, all like that are, are very, very efficient. They're very, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very recently put in. So we're not dealing with an issue of old equipment or things like that. So our ventilation in general is very good. Uh, it also helps that we're such an open facility. So we have 24 foot clear ceilings. Uh, we have garage doors, dock access, like a, a industrial building would have that we can open up to create some natural airflow uh, and things like that. Um, so we haven't really had to change anything just because, especially with the 24 foot high ceilings, we are much, our airflow is much more like an outdoor space than an indoor space. Obviously, if you're, if you're in a smaller gym with, you know, even 12 or 14 foot ceilings and maybe, you know, four or 5,000 square foot space. I know I work out at a CrossFit gym where they really can't run their fans or ventilation at all while people are in there because they're concerned about that airflow. We're in such a big open space um, that that hasn't been a challenge for us, but I know for other indoor facilities, uh, it has been because obviously you're trying to create airflow without also blowing around the particles and stuff that you don't want moving around a whole lot, so. So is that, does that potentially change in the winter? I mean, you know, rumor is it gets cold in Minnesota in the winter. <laughs> it, it does, it does. So it, one of the things that for us may be is just how we run our, our heating. So the other benefit that we have is all of our heating and cooling is from our ceiling. Um, so we're not blowing air at the surface level. Uh, so that will be a conversation that we'll have to have. So right now we're not running our air conditioning while people are in the building. Um, the first day we were in, it was 93. It was a little bit miserable. And now we're back in the 70s. So life is great. We have our garage doors propped open. Airflow is good. Temperature is comfortable. Um, but uh, right now from a air conditioning stand standpoint, uh, the only time that we're running our air is early in the morning before people come in. Or a little bit overnight, we're trying to avoid running that just to, again, try to limit any kind of unnatural airflow during uh, during the day as possible. Mm -hmm. So other questions for Jason, or even other questions, not necessarily for Jason, but amongst you that are on, what are, what are you facing now as things are beginning um, to open up in, in certain parts of the country? What are the challenges you're facing as for for this phase of the the COVID adventure? Anyone? Gabe, what new stuff did you see this week? A uh, couple interesting things is you know. So I was kind of interested to see what, what Jason had to say about how you know the how fast people are booking up time and things. Because I've seen in a, actually a couple of different sports as things are opening up this just drive to get teams out fast and maybe not have teams formed in traditional ways. So um, this week I worked with both a, a large soccer club and a large hockey club um, that just this week got, they're opening their seasons up, but they're not having traditional tryouts. So they're actually you know, using our system to look at uh, what the players have done in the past to form teams the best they can off of their, you know, past evaluations and then send out, um, send out the offers. And that was a really big thing that I was, it was interesting how fast that happened because in some of these areas where these sports opened up, um, it was like just a drive to get out offers because people didn't want to potentially lose players to other clubs doing something similar. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Um, positive too, in that there's a lot of stuff opening up and they are going to try to have um, seasons start, you know, not, not return to play, but return to team practice and to getting drills out and to keeping kids, you know, doing stuff over the summer. So um those, those are things that seem pretty interesting to me that how fast I got a couple of clubs that needed to get um, essentially tryout formation stuff out real fast. Um, and then just, you know, talking to people all over North America and all over the world, just uh, there's a large, large uh, difference in what's happening all over, right? Because there's some places that are totally opened up and they're, you know, doing everything and people are out in the fields and they're playing all the games and 
then we've got areas, you know, especially in Canada or some parts of the U S that, uh, there's, everything's totally still locked down. Um, and, uh, as much as there's differences there, I still see that there's a, you know, a lot of unity in everybody that is, uh, that is wanting to keep youth sports going. And I've seen a lot of, you know, just still good community stuff. You look on Facebook and you look on YouTube and you look on, you know, you, you name the social media you're on. There's still just a lot of positivity, um, around youth sports, you know, even with, you know, I just say with everything going on, there's, I'm, I'm surprised and, and, uh, you know, and, and heartened by the amount of positivity and support around youth sports. I mean, even like you watch the clubs I follow, the clubs I work with on Twitter and Facebook and different places and just seniors is a huge thing, right? You get all these seniors that, you know, this was their last season and maybe they're done with school. And I just see all these posts, you know, of an individual season who are individual senior. And they're like, congratulations to this senior for a great season and working with us in the past and congratulations to this senior. And just, you know, a lot of those kind of things, shout outs to people. So I think that's cool. I mean, when we can't be together in person in the places where you can't just a lot of real virtual support, which is, which is very nice. Yeah. Yeah. So Colin is saying New York is still on pause. Um, I talked to some folks in Alaska this week um, who are in soccer and uh, they're looking forward to starting league play only two weeks later than normal. So um, definitely a lot of, of difference. So a question for Jason, and then um, I want to, I want to go back to the waiver question. Um, Jason, have you turned off your water fountains inside your building? Yeah, so we have two water fountains that are actually the new ones, the water fountains that you can drink from, but you can also fill up your water bottles from. So we have the water fountain piece covered up so that cannot be, uh, be used, so they can't drink from the water fountain. Uh, but we did leave the part open where they could hold their water bottle up and have it filled because that's essentially contactless. Uh, so kids are able to still bring in their own water bottle and if they... Uh, if they want to fill that up at our water fountains, they uh, they can do that. Um, we're not doing any concessions, so our you know uh, our concessions are shut down. We don't anticipate open those for a while, so we basically communicated out to people that as far as you know they do need to bring in their own water uh, and things like that when they come in. Um, but they do have the ability to fill up their water bottles if they do run out, but no drinking from a fountain. All right, thank you. So um, we want to welcome Catherine Knorr. She's she's a, a friend of our conversations for a number of weeks. Um, she's actually an attorney, a specialist in sports law and insurance from um, the beautiful state of Hawaii. Um, so we're glad you were able to join us. Um, we had a question earlier. Um, Jason is from an indoor multi-sport facility in Minnesota. So we've been talking about facilities and, and how you, you open them up and social distance and keep them clean. Um, and he has a waiver that he asks people to sign um, to make sure they can use a facility. Um, and one of the questions was who drafted that waiver for him um, to make that happen. So um, if you all have questions about kind of waiver things and how to make that um, adapt to your, uh, to your situation, um, she's, she knows a lot more about that than the rest of us. Um, Can I mention something on the water bottle or the water? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so for risk management in terms of filling up water bottles, I don't see a problem with it. However, what I would do is make sure that they don't put their own water bottle under the under the spot to fill it up put like a clean glass or cup or something that isn't touched with your mouth and use that to fill the water bottle like fill fill that container and then fill the water bottle from there the reason why i say that is because one thing that happens in public places is that people are putting their own personal water bottle in under something and that they're where they're drinking from is actually touching the area where you're filling sometimes so um, um, the way I get around it when I'm filling a water bottle is like if I'm in an air, airport lounge I'll get a plastic cup and I'll just keep filling that plastic cup and filling my water bottle like that and um, I don't know what you can do but I wouldn't want to put the the drink points near that that oh. faucet or whatever. Anyway, onto liability waivers. That was just <laughs> liability, a risk, a risk management thing, and that's only because it drives me nuts when I see people like 
putting their, you know, dirty like cup up against something that I'm going to have to um, like get the germs from. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, are there other other questions, other comments about um, getting back on the field, um, managing your risk management? Um, I'm sort of jealous about Jason because he's got a facility where he can say everybody comes in through this door and I try, I'm trying to imagine a lacrosse field or a soccer field and, and persuading your teams or your trainers to all come in from the same entry point. Um, thinking of, you know, parks and, and they have multiple fields. Um, so I am a little bit jealous because Jason can have that that more of that control. Um, I, I think a, a general question that you know I continue to hear too is again kind of that assumption for risk piece and I know even when we started talking about reopening and things like that conversations with not only my insurance but my attorney and you know a lot of a back and forth is how that assumption of risk piece plays out so you know again we're kind of operating under the general guidelines that you know, we are being very diligent about following health guidelines and, and all those other pieces. But at the end of the day, understanding similar to people going out to restaurants or any other place that's open, knowing that at the end of the day, they are making the choice to go to those facilities, use those businesses and things like that, that there is some assumption of risk on their part to, uh, to, to do that. So, um, I guess that would be my question on any kind of the wavering things is what I've heard in general is that's kind of the terminology that you want to make sure that's in your waiver and what you have people sign and things like that. Uh, knowing that again, there has to be a piece in this puzzle that says as people choose to go out or not go out or participate in things and not participate in things that there is a level of assumption of risk that they're taking by doing those activities. Absolutely. And um, actually, there's in the law, there's primary assumption of risk and secondary assumption of risk. It's actually quite a complicated legal area. And every state has different ways of interpreting them. So the courts will rule differently. And so that's why it's important to not just copy a liability waiver um, on the internet because you will need to address your state's law. And when I draft a liability waiver, I do look at the particular state's law in relation to liability waivers before I draft it because I might make changes that would not be, might be not the same in, in Washington state versus Minnesota versus um, Hawaii or wherever, it might be different. And, um, you know, certainly in sport, whether you're playing football, golf, soccer, or something else, you're assuming the risk. And, and the courts have ruled favorably, generally, in these type of cases. However, we do see big verdicts. We do see big settlements. It kind of depends. If you're acting reasonably um, in your organization and you're acting with utmost care and 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 um, being actually applying good risk management then you have a better shot at not being uh, an organization that has a bad result in a lawsuit but one of the first things you're going to do in the liability waiver is you do want to have them um, you want to identify what risks in that liability waiver that they may be assuming. For example, um, in your liability waiver, you're going to say things like, you know, um, football is a dangerous sport. You could die. You know, um, you could contract COVID-19. You could contract a, a virus uh, by participating in this sport. And so you want to make it clear what types of potential risks there are so that when that person reads it, they will um, be um, 
they'll they'll get more understanding of what those are and then they're they're confirming by signing it that they agree to assume those risks if you don't include the risks specifically then the court may say you know they didn't know that they could die or contract a virus from this so they may not find it serves as a good defense so do you there are about three questions that have come up um, one of them is would you have a different waiver for players as compared to sports officials i mean would you have a, a waiver that is unique to the role they're playing in your sport um i think a lot of times okay here i will go to an example that you have very different roles okay um i officiated um for triathlon for about eight years. And in that role as an official, I had to ride a, on the back of a motorcycle a lot of the time. And clearly the triathletes, they were swimming, biking and running, and they were not, I wasn't swimming, I wasn't biking, I wasn't running. Well, maybe I might have to run in some situations, but, um, but I had different risks. So in that situation, if you really look at it, I'm assuming different risks as an official. However, if you have an official that is on the field with players, um, soccer, for example, um, the risks may be very similar. So I think that might be okay if you are, if the risks are similar. Um, if you are officiating a swim meet and you're at the edge of the pool, you still could be pushed in and drowned. But, you know, so that's possible. Um, so, you know, it kind of depends. And I think this is where when you're an event organizer, you have to think it through. It's, um, I always like my employees to activate their brain. And I think that I'm always impressed when they do rather than just like, you know, copy something or whatever. So I think, I think risk management and um, applying legal principles in sport is kind of requires some thought. Oh, geez, where were you this morning when I needed you? Um, another question um, from Brian, has there been any recent changes in legislation or ways insurance companies are handling or planning on handling COVID related claims. Have you seen those changes yet? Um, no, I, I have done a lot of, um, I, I watched at the beginning of the crisis, I was watching um, a webinar every morning on COVID-19 issues, which was pretty interesting. They were legal <laughs> webinars. So I was kind of, now they don't have as many, but they were just, Flooding, flooding us with legal webinars. And I watched a lot of business disruption, insurance um, related claims webinars. That was, that's kind of the big issue. And, and they were talking about legislation in that regard. Um, when I talk to claims people, which I talk to all the time um, because I do insurance defense litigation, which means that those that hire me are a lot of times the uh, claims adjusters and so I talked to them a lot and most of them are just saying they're they don't have a lot to do that they're kind of bored because there haven't been a lot of accident claims and obviously with everything shut down there's not a lot of claims right now and and there's not the the thing that people are trying to do is trying to get their business disruption insurance and so that's where the legislature has jumped in but in terms of sport I think that where the action is, is with national governing bodies and people like all of you who are trying to return to play um, and in, in different roles. And so, and I do know that insurers are looking at their products in terms of what they can provide in light of the new risks and how they need to um, change their policies. So in light of that um best to keep in good contact with your insurance broker and to probably every month or so maybe you shoot an email and say hey is there anything that going on that you know of that would impact my business um 
uh, because you know you want to find out if they have new products. The other thing too is when you um, are renewing your policy or buying a policy, make sure that you um, carefully read it and discuss it with your agent or broker so that you know whether there are exclusions that relate to pandemic that um, may not have been there before or coverage that might relate to pandemic that might not have been there before. And I think it'll be probably pretty broad, like virus or a pandemic, not COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a friend who writes insurance who said, right now trying to get insurance to cover viruses and COVID is like trying to buy earthquake insurance in the middle of the earthquake. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And you know what, when you, and if you try to buy hazard insurance, like earthquake or hurricane or something, um, usually um, there's a 30 day period uh, before there would co be coverage. So, you know, when you get your hurricane warning, it's too late. When you're in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it's too late. All right. So Jason has put in the chat box for those. Um, his website is adrenalinesc.com. Um, and they've got their, their guidelines posted that they're using for their facility. Um, his waiver isn't posted, but um, if, if you want that, let Jason know and um, he can send um, his, an example of what they're using. Um, one of the questions is about what does it cost to get a waiver if you go, um, whether Jason or Catherine, What's the fee? I mean, what are you looking at? Is it $50? Is it $500? Is it $1,000? I mean, what does it cost to actually get a waiver? Um, I'll tell you what I charge. Um, I, I have found that a flat rate is best for um, my, my sports clients on liability waivers. And if, if they have an existing wa liability waiver and it only requires just adding in some COVID-19 coverage and I don't have to do any research or anything, I might be able to get it down to about 250. But generally I charge about $500 if it's fairly simple. It might be more if it's multiple jurisdictions and I have to look at the law in multiple jurisdictions or if we're talking about complex sport events, um, then there might be a bigger charge. But I would say the average would be $500 for it. But keep in mind that um, by having that, that might save you thousands of dollars if should yeah. you have a lawsuit. So it's not a bad investment in your um, risk management financing. All right. We're beginning to wind down with time. What last question does any of you have before we, we wrap it up for today? What's that last thing you want to know? Anyone? Uh, I have a question I want to ask the audience too, because I've had this from some customers and just thinking on ideas is what people might be using for tracking methods for, you know, either tracking the things with the clubs, right? So you got players coming out tracking, if you got to track temperature, if you got to track that they at least agree that they don't have COVID-19, if they have to agree that they've been doing, you know, X, Y, Z things by whatever the rules are in the areas there. And anybody have any tracking systems in places or tools they're using or, ideas about that? Huh. It's For us right now, adrenaline tra tracking is 100% manual just until we get a full scope of what we're doing in. So yeah. um, we eventually want to turn things over, but uh, I know at least initially it's literally, um, especially with the being an indoor facility, knowing that dynamic is a little different, knowing who's coming through our doors at what time and, and knowing exactly who's in the building as we go. So, um, yeah, I have seen, I get, lots, I get lots of proposals for different tracking information to how to keep track of things. I, it's, it's the latest and greatest that comes up across your email. And I think eventually, a lot of us are gonna to wanna to try to put something in place to help track what's going on because I think it just helps in general. Uh, but I think, at least for me, it's a little bit of a wait and see to what that needs to look like before we commit to do anything. Yep. Yeah, I know I've seen a lot of, of protocols and requirements that you track things like affirming you haven't been sick or a temperature or whatever. And I'm, I'm wondering, 
just from a, a paperwork standpoint, how, how people are gonna do that if they have to report it to a league or, or some other authority. Um, it's interesting, I know in the general public, I saw some stuff that there's gonna be that one of the first partnerships between Android and Apple, where there's gonna be a kind of shared tracking app where you can turn it on and it's a really simple app but it will track where you are all the time which is kind of creepy but and then it'll be able to tell if you know if you're in contact with somebody that had COVID-19 you can hit the button or whatever and it'll essentially alert people and the government everybody that you've been in, in contact with so kind of uh, sickness tracking so interesting I mean I, I think a lot of the a lot of phones already have technologies like that but you know it's interesting to see the partnerships that are being made to try to make everything easier and, and more trackable with this. And, and it and it kind of conflicts with our privacy law, um, HIPAA, you know, like here we are, we have this uh, trend for, you know, 10, 20 years of making um, medical issues private. And all of a sudden here we are wanting to make it all public. And so it'll, there will be legal issues that are related there. Does anybody have any insight from Minnesota or outside Minnesota as far as what we hope is the next stage for kids, which is that limited contact, maybe up to like three on three uh, or anything like that. I know again, you have different things for different uh, sports, but I know the groups that, and obviously I'm keeping a close eye on it, but I know the groups that we have coming through are like training spine and kids are okay with that. But eventually we have to do something that looks like offense against defense, even if it's only up to three on three. Uh, this is Rick. Um, I think that's going to be coming within the next 10 to 15 days, actually. Uh, we went to phase three yesterday, which means we are up to pods of uh, 18 to 25. Uh, it's just no contact within those 25-man pods and stuff. So we have, you, we're very careful with how our contact is during those, uh, uh, those drills that we run. Um, but we went from phase two to phase three within 10 days for soccer. And so I'm expecting phase three to last about the same amount of time, about 10 days. And then I think we'll see it go to phase four where there's more contact. Uh, we're pretty close to what Idaho is doing. Idaho kind of is like yeah. leading the pack as far as returning to play as, um, they've been in phase three. Uh, since June 1st through the 15th and the 15th they're going to phase four. Um, so I think it's actually coming a lot sooner uh, depending on your sport. Oh, wow, we, we just went to phase two here where I live in Washington State and we still have counties in phase one or phase one and a half. So um, it's fascinating to me to see the the pace is different depending on on where you are. I think um, I think that phase shift to having that limited contact helps out just everybody in general, not only from a standpoint of what you can actually do, even if it's only up to three on three or five on five or whatever your limited numbers are. Uh, but um, I also think it also makes it a lot easier on, on coaches and everybody else that's trying to do this right and do this properly and keep kids safe. Uh, but also knowing that you know, throughout an, an hour, hour and a half training session, whatever you're doing, um, for the ability for kids to come in proximity to each other as you're working through things just expands what you're able to do uh, and also allows the kids to, to stay, you know, more, more engaged and, you know, if nothing else, also provide your parents a little bit uh, more leeway to, to understand that games and you know, things looking like what they used to look like is still a ways off. But if we can get on the field and let kids play and interact with each other uh, in a limited capacity, as long as they can get close to each other so they can look like work on things that look a little bit more like a game. Uh, I think that's a huge step for, for everybody that they're looking for right now. Right. And, well, I, and I also think it would help in, in the monitoring piece, because again, as we have people in and out here, and I, I look part of it as our the AKA program that's in here. Um, and what and what they're doing, you know, they they deal with kids from anywhere between six and twelve years old, and obviously the dynamics a little different because they're more of a daycare facility for them. Uh, but it's the same thing. Yeah, you know, kids are here for six or seven hours, and they're doing as much as they can to keep them away from each other. But you can't ke keep six through eight year olds away from each other for six hours in a row entirely. It's just it's impossible. 
you can't keep 16 and 17 year olds away from each other in an hour and a half <laughs> time period either. Um, exactly. Well, and they're also doing they're also doing it in their backyard and at the parks and things like that too. So there's right. that piece of it that you know we can control things within our own environments, but um, you know they're they're doing similar activities in spaces outside of those controlled sports environments. So. Uh, I think there's a natural thought process that it has to at least be able to look somewhat similar to what's going on elsewhere. Right. It's called uh, implied pressure is what, uh, is what, is what it's called. And I think I had to yell implied pressure about 20 times last night because they wanted to go at it hard and stuff because they've been cooped up. And, you know, last week in the, the first two weeks of June, we kept them, groups of 10 and separated by six feet now that we've gone to the bigger groups they they're like okay this is a big group scenario we're going after it and stuff so uh, we still have to try to maintain a little bit of distancing and stuff but um, it is good to um, to have that big group mentality and stuff um, if anybody wants to see um, what Idaho is doing um, the Boise Thorns and the Boise Timbers uh, yeah. have put out the, their return to play protocols. Yeah. And it's a really good document to, to look for as for resources and guidance because they seem to be leading the way. That's what we've kind of, ta I've taken a couple of paragraphs from their return to play and kind of uh, applied it to our program here in, in the Rochester area of Minnesota. And, um, you know, our club is very small, but you know, we've had really good, almost maximum participation from our athletes and they're just loving being back. So mm -hmm. right. does anybody have any idea of if any studies are being done out there? I got to imagine that there is as far as specific, you know, to sports in general, but even youth sports, as far as, again, I guess, transferability of, you know, virus and, and things like that. So, you know, I'm just, I'm curious, I keep waiting for something to come out that says, you know, X group did a study where they, in a controlled environment, they had kids playing three on three or five on five. And, you know, the, the transmission in that setting is X, uh, you know, or, or what that actually looks like. Or I, I don't know if that's going to happen before we get to a point where it's going to be happening, where that type of play resumes, or if that will just kind of help justify that once those next phases come, come in. I've seen some studies for individual sports like running um, and and the proximity around a single athlete. Um, I haven't seen group sports yet, um, but I do nerd out on that stuff. But have you, but ha have any of you read recent um, uh, news that it's been determined, and I'm not sure how valid this is, but it's been determined that um, asymptomatic people, um, it's rare to get it from someone who's asymptomatic. Have you seen that? I saw that and then I saw almost a retraction of that. Oh, okay. so I've actually mm -hmm. seen both one piece said, well, maybe it's not that big a deal. And then someone else said, whoa, whoa, we spoke too soon. So oh, okay. I think it's still confused. <laughs> okay. Because if that's true, if it's rare to get it from someone who's symptomatic, then your primary role would be to make sure that they're they're asymptomatic and have them not engage in any contact or close contact if they have any symptoms you know yeah. however if that's wrong then it goes out the window you know yeah. then you just never know it's a crapshoot yeah so there was well, a, a last question for jason um is the the camp daycare program you have are the kids wearing masks in that program no, they're actually, there's a, there's a piece in the CDC guidelines that they're following, which actually says, especially for their age group, because it is younger, most of their kids are between 6 and 12. They have some 13 and 14 year olds also, but most of them are between 6 and 12, that uh, the CDC actually recommends that kids of those younger ages actually don't wear a mask, just because at that age, they're going to tend to have their hands then up more by their face more, <laughs> because they're constantly messing with the mask. So it kind of defeats the purpose of having a mask when you're constantly fiddling with the mask, because you know, again, at, th at those ages, they're not able to. So, uh, so yeah, they're, they're actually recommendation 
and I, I haven't seen any of the kids wearing a mask is that the kids actually don't wear a mask uh, because they're trying to keep them keep their hands away from their face as much as possible knowing that that's probably a bigger issue than that and then obviously they're they're also remind them daily about their hand sanitation and then covering their cough and things like that when things happen. So I think that awareness piece is a big part of it. So, you know, when any of us see a kid cough or anything like that, we try to get them to sanitize their hand real quick or, or regardless. But uh, I think for those younger ages, the, the mask just doesn't make sense because A, they're not going to wear it right for the time of period that they're in there and B, they're going to be constantly messing with it with their hands, which are probably the bigger issue are around there by their face. So. Yep. Well, we just recently, and out of all these roundtables I've sat on this week, which is about about seven, um, uh, our club is one of the first clubs that I've heard that has actually had a COVID positive athlete come back from all medical and quarantine protocols and return to training. So, oh, wow, good. So um, it took a lot of communication between the family and making sure that the families of the players and stuff knew this was happening and stuff. But we've had a pretty positive response from our parents um, as to our communication and how we communicated it out with them and stuff and their acceptance of that athlete back into the fold. So that was really, it's been really a positive, even though it's a pandemic. <laughs> um, we did have somebody test positive mid-May during the quarantine. They met all medical protocols, all quarantine protocols were um, cleared by the Minnesota Department of Health and she returned to play on Monday. Wonderful. <laughs> That's good to hear. Wow. Oh, so in the chat, you'll see Catherine's put her email if, if you want to contact her with questions. Um, and we invite you if you have topics, things that you want us to talk about next Thursday, um, you can send them to me or to Gabe um, or type them in when you register. Um, we've moved the conversations to Thursdays from Fridays um, in the hopes that as we get returned to play, your Fridays will be busier doing other things. So <laughs> hopefully we will see you again next week with um, whatever it is you want to talk about. Aloha. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>